morning and welcome to this press conference. Uh, today is Chemistry Day at the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. We have concluded our meeting and we are ready to announce this year's Nobel Prize in Chemistry. And as usual, we'll do it both in English and in Swedish. I'm Göran Hansen, Secretary General of the Academy. With me on the podium today is to my right, Professor Sara Snogerup-Linse, Chairman of the Nobel Committee for Chemistry. And on my left, Professor Olof Ramström, who is a member of the committee and an expert in the field of the prize. And later on, we hope to have one of our new Nobel laureates with us on a phone line. This year's Nobel Prize in Chemistry is about the world's smallest machine. Årets Nobelpris handlar om världens minsta maskiner. Kungliga Vetenskapsakademin har beslutat att utdela 2016 års Nobelpris i kemi gemensamt till Jean-Pierre Sauvage, Sir James Fraser Stoddart och Bernard L. Ferencha för design och syntes av molekylära maskiner. The Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences has decided to award the 2016 Nobel Prize in Chemistry jointly to Jean-Pierre Sauvage, Sir James Fraser Stoddart and Bernard L. Ferencha for the design and synthesis of molecular machines. L'Académie Royale de Sciences de Suède a décidé ce jour d'attribuer le prix Nobel de chimie 2016 à Jean-Pierre Sauvage, Sir James Fraser Stoddart et Bernard L. Ferencha pour la conception et la synthèse des machines moléculaires pour design et synthèse moléculaire des machines. Za projektirovanie i syntez molekularnych maschin. Here we have our new Nobel laureates with us on the screen above me. And Jean-Pierre Sauvage was born in Paris in 1944. He is now Emeritus Professor at the Université de Strasbourg and Director of Research Emeritus at the Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique, CNRS, in Strasbourg, in France. Sir James Fraser Stoddart was born in 1942 in Edinburgh in the United Kingdom. He is currently the Board of Trustees Professor of Chemistry at Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois, United States. And Bernard or Ben Ferincha was born in 1951 in Barger Compascum in the Netherlands. He is Professor of Organic Chemistry at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. So that's our new Nobel laureates. And now I'd like to give the word to Professor Snogerup Linse, who will provide some introductory remarks on this year's Nobel Prize in Chemistry. Sara, please. Thank you. Maybe this morning you ground your coffee. Maybe you used a motorized vehicle to get here. You used man-made machines operating on the centimeter to meter length scale. It's been the dream of scientists for over half a century to take this development all the way down to the molecular scale. That nanometers. A nanometer is one million times smaller than a millimeter. In here, we have some molecular machines. A molecular motor, a molecular muscle, a molecular memory, an elevator, and there's a molecular car. This amazing development is due to several ingenious chemical innovations. A machine needs movable parts and a mechanism to convert energy input to motion in a defined direction. So the first challenge for the chemist was to make something that can move. This one you may recognize from yesterday. This one won't do the work. It's beautiful, but it needs to be connected to something. One way to make 
a physical connection is this, somewhat more ugly, but here we have two wings that move relative to one another, but they are freely joined. There is no chemical bond between them. To make this one is a piece of cake. You can buy it at the local supermarket. This one requires some very clever chemistry. And this year's laureates have developed new synthetic strategies to make molecules like this with good yields. The second challenge is to convert energy input to motion in a defined direction. Here, the problem is that molecular systems have a strive to reach equilibrium and fluctuate around it in random motions. So here, the challenge was to overcome this and the laureates took advantage of a molecular property called chirality or asymmetry. So now you may be curious to see what these machines look like. I'm sorry, you can't see them. They are more than a thousand times smaller than a human hair. So we need a magnifying lens, and I think my colleague Ola Brandström can help here. Thank you for that, and thank you, Sara. So definitely we need a magnifying lens. So as you heard, this award is all about the world's smallest machines, the world's tiniest machines. And you can actually see an example of such a machine in this little picture. This is a microscope uh, image. And you cannot only see it, you can also see it moving, as you can see here. And they are really very tiny, these structures. Only a few nanometers in long length. And as you heard, as a comparison, a strand of hair is more than 1,000 times thicker. So really the tiniest possible machine you can experience. So how can you make these machines? Well, as Sara very cleverly uh, explained to you, one very, very important breakthrough in this area came in 1983, when Jean-Pierre Sauvage and his group um, uh, made a so-called molecular chain. And the way they did this is that they constructed a molecular ring, and this is uh, symbolized here in blue, and they had a molecular crescent-shaped uh, a crescent shaped molecule here in red, and you can see the chemical structures here on the side. And when you mix those two structures together with a small copper ion, the copper ion can act as a type of glue, gluing those two pieces together in a type of complex like this. And what you then can do is that can you add a third component, another red component here, you can see the structure over here, and then you can stitch them together chemically. And what you then will get after you remove them, the copper ion is a type of molecular chain type of structure, also known as a catenane. And here you have a, a type of mechanical bond where the two rings can move freely relative to each other, but cannot come loose from one another. So it's a type of mechanical bond. What uh, this opened the entire field of molecular machinery, and it also reinvigorated another field, which is called topological chemistry, where you actually study very complex situations like this. What Jean-Pierre Sauvage and his group also uh, realized at this point was that here you have what is called translational isomerism. Because in the presence or in the absence of metal ion here, you have a large shift in shape uh, in the structure, up to one nanometer change in shape. Another very, very important breakthrough in this area came in 1991, when uh, Fraser Stoddart and his group designed a so-called molecular shuttle. They used another type of mechanical bond uh, which is based on an electron-rich axle like this in red here. And they also made a ring-shaped molecule, which is electron-poor. And you can see it's open here on one side. And the structures you can find down here. If you mix those two structures together in a solution, electron-rich will be attracted by electron-poor. And then you can ring-close the structure. And now you have formed a type of rotaxane structure 
where you have the ring can move freely along the axle, but cannot come loose because of the two large stoppers at each end here. And this is another type of mechanical bond, as you may understand. And here what you can see also is that you have a shuttle effect so that this ring can move between two different stations in this axle, on this axle. So you can see it can move like this. After these fundamental discoveries, what these two groups could also show is that you can actually control this movement. So in 1994, uh, the Stoddard group could show by building in asymmetries in the axle that you can actually control the movement of the ring between the two stations. And this you can do, for example, by electrochemical means. In the same year, the Sauvage group can show similarly that you can build in asymmetries in the catenane rings and by electrochemistry you can also control the movement, the rotation of one ring relative to one another. After these fundamental breakthroughs, both of these groups have done a lot of work and they have constructed more and more complex structures and more and more functional structures. Just to give you a couple of examples out of very many, uh, Sauvage group have, for example, designed a molecule, uh, constructed a molecule which, uh, which can extend and contract, extend and contract dramatically in a very controlled manner. And this is exactly, this is actually mimicking the function that we see in our muscle tissue. So you can call it a type of molecular muscle. And the Stoddard group, they have done many things. One example they made uh, was a so-called molecular elevator or lift, where you have a plane in red here that can move between two stations upon external stimulus, external stimulus like so. So one component in a machine that is very, very important is the motor component, and especially maybe the rotary motor component and in particular a component that we can rotate only in one direction. And that is a fundamental challenge, and that challenge was met in 1999 by Ben Feringa and his group. So what they could do in this particular case was that they made a molecule, they built in asymmetries in the molecule, and they had two rotor blades, as you can see here, connected to what is called an isomerizable bond, a bond that can change. And using this structure, they can get unidirectional directional rotation. And the way this works is that when you shine light to this m uh, molecule, the rotor blade will flip over, like so, almost 180 degrees. There you see. And that will create tension in the molecule, as you can see here. That doesn't, the molecule doesn't like tension. It wants to release the tension. And that happens in the thermal step, which is irreversible pretty much irreversible. And then you have another pulse of, of light coming in. You get another flip of the rotor. You create more tension. And then in the final step, you have a thermal relaxation, relaxation again, and then you're back at where you started. And this cyclic moment you can do over and over again in a very unidirectional rotation manner. After this fundamental breakthrough in 1999, the Feringha group and other groups have been working continuously on this field, and they have perfected their structures even more. So nowadays they have structures that can rotate very fast, up to 12,000 revs per second. They have ro motors that can rotate in either direction. They, have also, they can also change the direction at will, if they want to. They have also worked with, uh, they also show that you can use these molecular motors, these tiny molecular motors, to rotate much, much larger objects as you can see here. Here you have a glass rod. And this glass rod is a micrometer size. That means that it's 10,000 times larger than the little molecular motor. And as you can see, the motor action can actually be used to, to drive the rotation of this very large rod in comparison. And the final example I have for this from this group is a more playful example. And what they wanted to show here is they wanted to demonstrate that, they can con that you can control the motion of a small machine on a surface. And what they actually did then was that they, they, they constructed a molecule where you have a, an axle type of structure, and in each corner of this axle they connect 
a motor component. So what this then will look like is some kind of four-wheel drive small molecular car. And the way they imagine this to work is you can see on this cartoon where you can see that this turtle can move along the surface in this manner. And this particular uh, machine or, or uh, molecule is exactly what you see here. That's what you see the machine moving along the surface. So what these three lorries have shown, have done, they have opened this entire field of molecular machinery and they have constructed, have they have shown that it's indeed possible to make a machine or machine-like function at a molecular scale. And they have really mastered motion control at the molecular scale. So now, I think you all can say that this is really fantastic, right? But what is it used for? What can it be used for? And I would like to say that this is, until now, fundamental science. This is basic fundamental science. They have addressed scientific fundamental, fundamental scientific challenges and shown that this is indeed possible. And you can say, probably you can say that the, the development stage here is similar to what it was in the beginning of the 19th century when many scientists demonstrated different electrical machines, as you can see of some of them here. And of course, these electrical machines from the beginning of the 19th century, they created a revolution. And as you can see, we have nowadays we have electrical machines everywhere. So we think that uh, these small molecular machines, we have seen some tendencies towards uh, applications, but the future will say, we will show what kind of applications will come out of this. So by that, I just want to give the word back to our Secretary Dieter. Thank you very much, Olof. It's an exciting uh, set of discoveries, an exciting field, isn't it? I we may now have one of our new Nobel laureates with us on the phone line. Professor Ferinja, are you there? Yeah, yeah, I'm there. Great, thanks for being with us again. This is Jaron Hansson who called you. Can uh, you hear me? I hear you loud and clear. Can you hear me? Yeah. Good. So I'm the guy who called you about an hour ago. And but now I'm to give you the good news. But now I'm sitting in the session hall of the Academy and we have journalists from all over the world here. Um, and they are, of course, eager to ask you questions. So are you ready to take some questions? Sure. Now? Great. Who yes, would like of course. Wonderful. Who would like to start? Thomas von Heine, fast as always. <laughs> this is Swedish television here. Congratulations, Professor. Um, I'd like you to tell us Thank two you. things, actually. First, what did you say when you heard the message today? And then, what did you say when you saw your first functioning molecular machine? Several years ago, I guess. Now, what I said when I, when, what I, said when I got this message that I said, I'm, uh, um, I don't know what to say. And I'm a bit shocked, you know, because it was such a, a great surprise. And then my second remark was, I'm so honored. And uh, I'm also emotional about this. Um, second, uh, your second point, uh, what I said when we saw this machine working for the first time, uh, this was uh, also a shock because for the first time we saw really movement of things, you know, and we saw that there was a kind of a motor type function. So I was, uh, I could hardly believe that it worked yet. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Who's next? That's the lady over there. You get the microphone. Uh, I'm Anneli Megner Arn from uh, TV4. Congratulations on the prize. Thank you. And I wonder if you can imagine what your cars and elevators can be made for. Could it, for instance, be transporting medical to active sites where they do the most, uh, where they do what they are meant for? Yeah, you, you are absolutely right. <laughs> it is a bit early days, of course. But once you are able to control movement, you have a motor, you can think of all kinds of functions. So indeed, we think of transporters, uh, like in your body, there are many motors and machines that make it possible that your cells divide, that your muscles work, that there is transport in the cells. 
etc. But you can think also which broader. Think about nano machines, micro robots. Think about tiny uh, robots that you, uh, the doctor in the future will inject in your blood veins and that go to search for a cancer cell or are going to deliver a, t uh, a drug, for instance. But also smart materials, for instance, materials that can co co adapt, uh, change, uh, depending on an external signal, just like our body functions. That is the kind of functions you can think of. Great. Fascinating, isn't it? Sky's the limit. Who'd like to continue? More questions? They seem overwhelmed here by the, uh, all the possibilities that open up with molecular machines. Yeah. Now let me yes. add to that. I feel uh, a little bit, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, congratulations uh, to the prize. Uh, My name is Jana Rose from uh, Nobel Media, just now. Um, Thank you. I, I wonder uh, what is the challenge to do now for you and your colleagues? Yeah, now first of all, let me say, I feel a little bit like the Wright brothers, eh? who were flying 100 years ago for the first time and then people were saying, you know, why do we need a flying machine? And now we have a Boeing 747 and an Airbus. So that is a bit how I feel. But yes, the opportunities are great because if you think what kind of materials we can make these days with the chem chemistry and when you are able to introduce dynamic functions and build machines or build materials that can change function, there is endless opportunity. So we will build smart materials in the future. That is uh, a, a big opportunity. Materials that will uh, reconfigure, that will change, that will adapt themselves, that will have uh, properties that can change because of the pick of the signal. You can think of nanoscale energy converters. So uh, make tiny machines that can store energy and can use that energy. Uh, and indeed, it opens up a whole new field of uh, nano machines. Thank you. Yes. Gentleman from Expressen. Yes, yes Frederick Lenander from Expressen. Uh, congratulations, Professor, to the Nobel Prize and your fine achievements in the field. Thank you very much. Uh, last year, one of the laureates in chemistry uh, told us that he would uh, spend a good amount of money on wine. What are your <laughs> <laughs> plans for spending the money that you want today? Excuse me? I didn't understand your last point. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering yes. how you're going to celebrate this fine achievement and what are you going to spend your money on? Yeah, no, we are, of course, celebrating this with our team of all the uh, talented young students and postdocs that have been working for all those years on this program. So I want to give all the credit to the co-workers and all the people in my team, which was uh, fantastic and it would not have been possible. So we certainly will celebrate with them. And uh, we are, uh, of course, this is the start of uh, a, a new period where we are really going to, uh, to try to use these tiny machines for all kinds of uh, new applications and so. Thank you. Please, next Thank question. You. Professor, f um, congratulations on your prize. David Keaton from the Associated Thank Press. Thank you so much. Um, now, obviously, the 19th century, um, the discoveries of the 19th century yielded the aeroplane, uh, the drill, lots of yes. wonderful uh, innovations, but also some very deadly ones. Uh, this could also uh, lead potentially, uh, would you imagine to, what, well, I'll put it another way, what are your worst nightmares with this discovery? What do you fear from your discovery? Now, uh, I don't know if I have really nightmares. The nice thing is about that we can design all these uh, synthetic uh, motors and machines and so, that we can induce all kinds of autonomous functions. So, so far, when we build a material, a chemical, whatever, you know, they, they are there, but they don't have any dynamic functions or autonomous function. In the future, we have all kinds of materials that will have autonomous functions, just like a bacterial cell or so in the future, uh, just like a cell in, a, in, in your body or a bacterial cell or so. And I think uh, we have to think about uh, uh, how we can handle these things uh, safely. But uh, I'm not so worried about that because once we are able to design these tiny of micro machines and, and these nano robots, we will also have the opportunity to build in all kinds of safety devices if that is needed and so. For the time being, I think, we, uh, we use these uh, materials and so and we treat them as, as any chemical, you know, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, any, te if we would 
for them to use these tiny uh, motors and so in a biological context, they have to go through a very uh, uh, a careful uh, evaluation with respect to toxicity and all these things. So uh, we are aware of these things. Hey, yes, the lady over there. Dear Professor, I, my name is Åsa yeah. Husberg and I work in the Nobel Museum and gratis, as we say in Swedish, yeah. congratulations. Um, Thank you so much. How come, when did you first start to think about that I would like to make research about molecular machines? How did you come up with the idea? Yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting point. We started, when I was in my early days of my career, I started uh, building switches just like Fraser Stoddard and Jean-Pierre Tovage. So we could, you know, a switch, you switch between zero and one, just like a, a, in your uh, a, a light switch. And the whole idea was to do, have an alternative for information storage. And we wanted to use light and to switch between two states in the molecule. And then suddenly we discovered that besides switching, we could also make a movement that continued in one direction. And that was the start of our rotary motors. And once you have to build a rotary motor, then you know you can control motion at that nano scale because our motors are only one nanometer, one billionth of a meter in size. And so once you can control motion, you can think about all kinds of dynamic functions like movement, like uh, uh, transporters, like uh, tiny machinery. So it started all with switches. A simple idea, zero one switch. Simple ideas are the best ones. So um, I think that was the last question. So thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Ferinka, for being with us uh, at the press conference. And uh, I hope to see you here in December again. Thank you so much. Thank I'm you. It was my pleasure. Bye bye for now. Bye bye. Thank you. Are there any questions to the panel before we close? Uh, we seem to be running out of time, but if there are any quick questions to the panelists. If not, we'll close this first part of the press conference. I know that several of you have requested interviews with uh, experts from the Nobel Committee, and they will continue shortly. So thank you very much um, for your interest and uh, in the Nobel Prize. Thanks, bye.
Sara Snogger of Linse. You chair the Nobel Committee for Chemistry and have just announced the Nobel Prize of this year, which is about the tiny molecular machines. How small are they? Yes, uh, yeah, they are very, very small. They're so small you can't see them. Uh, you can't see them by eye. You can't even see them by a light microscope. So they are on the nanometer, so one to 10 nanometer large. Uh, and a nanometer, if you take a millimeter and divide it in one million parts, each part is a nanometer. So they are like one million parts of a hair stroke. Yeah, yeah. they're about ten, uh, one to 10,000 times smaller than a human hair. Oh, wow. Yes. And uh, you mentioned also that the dream is old to construct such tiny yes. machines. Uh, so how can they overcome the challenges? Yeah, that's a very good question because I think the dream started in the end of the 1950s uh, with Feynman's lectures where he gave a challenge to the scientists. Richard to Feynman. Uh, Richard Feynman, exactly. Place, yes. Laurie. To construct molecules that could act as machines. Uh, and there are two obstacles. One obstacle is this thing that you need to have parts that are freely movable either physically movable or you need some kind of isomerizable bonds. That's one challenge. And the other challenge is that molecular systems always want to reach equilibrium and fluctuate around it and they do have all the random motions. So it's a main challenge to create motion in one defined direction. So when you put in energy, you want your system to either rotate or move in the direction you have desired and not randomly. So they yes. didn't want to have them silent in equilibrium, but they also wanted to stop the movement, the brown, Brownian movement. Yeah, or at least overcome it, because you can't really stop it. It's there too, uh, but you have to come around it. Uh, and, and one way they found to come around it was to use asymmetric molecules, so that when you waste their energy, they come in a frustrated or tense state, and when they relax, they will be more prone to relax in one direction compared to the other because of their asymmetry. And once they have relaxed, they can't get back. And, uh, and then they can move. So I wa wonder what does fuel them? How can they move? <laughs> they move because we give them energy. So they are not autonomous. They are moved at will from the user. So we put in a light source, we put in heat, or we put in chemical energy. So they are like the man-made motors. You have to put in some kind of fuel. Mm -hmm. And the fuel is almost like, I, I thought about plants, for example. They also live uh, by light, so exactly. to say, putting yes. light on them. Mm -hmm. uh, so is there a dream to construct living molecules? Uh, I don't think that this type of development will lead to living molecules. The living means that something can also replicate itself. Uh, and there is nothing in those molecules that we award today that allow them to replicate themselves. Mm. Well, well, when we talk about nano machines and nano uh, molecules, uh, the, there is also a lot of science fiction about that. And then the nano robots are the main heroes of science fiction stories, and also they pose a threat when they start to self-replicate themselves. So what do you think about those machines? Are they a big promise or a big threat? Uh, I think they're mainly a big promise because they don't have this property of self-replication. So they cannot really take over. Uh, and they are all controlled by an energy input. So if you don't want them to do something, you can just stop the energy input and they will stop working. And now they are with us here. So what is the next step? What what is really the dream and the vision now? I think one of our laureates put this very nicely when we called him, that this is the start of a new molecular era. So we think this is a very right time to award this Nobel Prize because this is when it takes off towards the applications. And we can only guess. But smart materials for sure will come. Materials that can change shape or function or properties when you, for example, shine light on them. There was all, we mentioned also uh, something that also Richard Feynman mentioned before. It was about uh, minuscule machines uh, that can bring the medicines to the body to swallow a doctor, yes. she mentioned. 
Is yes. this, uh, this is also a perspective, um, and one of our laureates, Ben Floringa, has done some work in that direction uh, with antibiotics that are photo switchable, so you can activate it just in the place where you need the activity. So they have to move it to find the place. Mm -hmm. And then you can actually activate them from outside. Um, there are three laureates and three different machine types, as I understand. Mm -hmm. Was it a race, a big competition, who's coming to be first? Uh, I don't think so. I think they actually came in sequence. So I think Sauvage was the first one making the interlocked wings and, uh, and developing the synthesis, how to make uh, with good yield. Because I think these kind of molecules could be made before, but the yield was very poor because they mostly self, you got most of those. <laughs> And so you have to play tricks to get high yield of the interlocked structures. What, what's yeah. wrong with this one? Uh, there's really nothing wrong because you can see it's twice here, but it takes two to tango. Mm. Uh, and a machine needs more than one part. You can't make a machine of one part. You have to have at least two. Mm. I understand. So this is the, the dead one. <laughs> That's the dead one. And here are two dead ones, but together they come alive. So you, did they cooperate in any in any way, or if they didn't compete? <laughs> the uh, laureates. I think they actually have co cooperated. They seem to be good friends, all of them, and they have also worked together on some projects. So they are more, much more cooperators. Uh, what's going on now? The, the, the last uh, machine mentioned in the Nobel Prize uh, motivation was uh, from 1999. So it's uh, almost two decades ago. Yes. What happened after that? Uh, a lot of groups around the world have taken up uh, this field. So it's really an exploding field in chemistry. So there are enormous amount of groups. They repeat what the lawyers have done, which is a fantastic achievement. I mean, it means that it's solid, very good solid methods that others can repeat in other labs. And then they have continued to build onto this. Uh, and one development is these materials that they actually change shape when you shine on them. And all three laureates are still active in the field? Uh, they are still active, yes. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah, for taking your time. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you very much.